present he is um, in person. Um, he is in Proper, the Spanish Church of Pensay, and in front of him at the podium are provided two copies of his right to the All right. So, Mr. Hensley, we are back this morning for circuit court sentencing. He's appearing in person. We did try to start this earlier with him remote at the jail. It just made more sense for the court to have him present where we're not trying to talk through Zoom. So, Mr. Hensley, here we are again today, sir. First, I want to start with this. When I read you a couple of weeks ago, you were given the opportunity to request court appointed counsel. And you were also given the opportunity for the last several months to retain your own counsel. Are you representing yourself today, sir? For objection, for the record, make the record reflect. My application is Malik, title is B. Worst American National of the Islam. Anything else? Proper persona, so jurist. All right. So, sir, the information that I have in front of me has your listed name as Milton Joseph Hensley Jr. So, you've been through this before. Respectfully, I'm going to call you by the name that is listed in the information, Mr. Hensley. So, Mr. Hensley, do you wish to proceed by representing yourself today, sir? Over my fifth amendment right. All right. You don't wish to answer any questions from the court? Over my fifth amendment right. All right. So you're not going to answer the court when I'm asking, do you wish to proceed representing yourself today for circuit court sentencing? Do you wish to do that, Mr. Hensley? Objection. My appellation is Malik. My title is B. All right. So then let's get this on the record. Um, as far as the PSI, Ms. Fon, um, it would appear that the court has a copy of this. Mr. Butler apparently has it. And then what do you know about Mr. Hensley receiving this copy? Uh, that he was emailed a copy. And it's my understanding the one was picked up at the office by someone for him. All right. So, Mr. Hensley, have you had a chance to review the pre-sentence report, sir? Objection. My appellation is Malik. Title is B. And for the record, you have my nationality information within your files. So, you know my appellation. All right. So, when was our PSI completed, Ms. Bond? Looks like 229 of 04. Yes. Just cut it, reviewed it. And so after the review, that would have went out to all the parties for some time in March. Okay. Um, just while we were I'm pulling this up, um, the, it appears that there would have to be an additional jail credit um, okay. as he was arrested on the um, There's an additional 12 days from 418 and 2040 today. So we can make that correction and, and update the jail credit. The PSIs were sent out on 229 today. So I also want the record to reflect. I've seen Mr. Hensley several times as it relates to sentencing. He had been appearing for all of his court appearances. He had been cooperating with the court as it relates to expressing his desire to represent himself in these proceedings. He's never wavered from that, which is why the court is inquiring again today. I recognize that sentencing is an important part of the circuit court process. It's uh, certainly a, uh, a hearing, if you will, that would require an entitled, I should say, the defendant to the assistance of an attorney, which is why I'm asking. However, the court is balancing that with the idea that this circuit court sentencing date has been delayed several, several, several times, and the court can't help but glean at this point, it just appears to be a delay tactic. The court 
if you sift that back through the dates, has given Mr. Hemsley several times to hire counsel. He expressed that interest. Again, it appears in hindsight that it's simply a delay tactic. Court has given Mr. Hensley several times, uh, actually not even with the sentence that the court's required to give here in a moment, um, keeping him out on bond to do those things, explore counsel. Even after being arrested on the warrant when he failed to appear, court also gave him the opportunity again to request court appointed counsel. In fact, the public defender's office appeared at his arraignment Mr. Hensley Bays had the ability to fill out the affidavit and request counsel. Here this morning, in response to the court's questioning, he does not appear interested in answering the court's questioning. Again, it appears to be a delay tactic. I am comfortable that the pre sentence report has been provided months ago to Mr. Hensley. I am comfortable Mr. Hensley has given, been given ample opportunity either to retain counsel to ask for court appointed counsel. And therefore, the court's going to proceed with sentencing today. I can't continue to allow this delay of the matter uh, in what appears to simply be a, at this point, series of uh, uh, incidents and responses or lack thereof of responses simply to delay the matter. I know Mr. Hensley's been engaged with this. We have several filings that are not court filings that he has continued to uh, send to the clerk's office, um, some of which he has referenced, none of which have anything to do with the case and or the court's requirement to get him sentenced now that he has uh, been convicted several months ago of these crimes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with then Mr. Butler, as it relates to the PSI, are you aware of any corrections, additions, or deletions that need to be made with it other than what we've already placed on the record with probation? Uh, I would just um, ask the court to take a look at Fence Variable 4 um, regarding psychological injury to the victim. Um, we did receive a victim impact statement. It looks like it came from Robert uh, Siegel, um, who was the male occupant of the vehicle. In this case, the victim. Uh, we received that just this morning about, uh, about two hours ago. Uh, back now. So I can read that. I do believe it references um, facts that it validates for it. All right. So why don't you read that? Okay. Uh, this is from Rob. Rob Siegel, that's S-I-E-G-E-L. He says, I do have things to say to the judge and the proceedings that I would like to be read during the sentencing below. Your Honor, I apologize for not being here in person today, but I could not find the time again to keep seeing this through. The amount of stress and anxiety Mr. Hensley has caused my family is downright disgusting and infuriating. Pull a gun on a family driving down the highway for nothing more than getting out of his way fast, not getting out of his way fast enough is obscene. My daughter, who was only nine years old at the time with special needs, was terrified and it took months for her to feel comfortable riding in any vehicle again because she was scared someone was going to cut her life short for seemingly no reason at all. My wife had to start and is still in therapy over this whole situation, which is thankfully, which has thankfully helped her anxiety levels to become manageable, but also is not covered under our insurance. So it's cost us quite a large sum of money, and that brings with it its own stresses to our family and social life. I find myself driving and cannot seem to relax because anyone I see speeding up behind us reminds me of the terrible people in the world and just how ignorant someone can be with, dis with disregard for others' lives, including those of his own family and child in the car. Being that there, has been, that there are previous charges against Mr. Hensley for almost the exact same situation where he brandishes a gun and threatens to kill people because of his unchecked aggression and inability to safely operate a vehicle, which then turns to road rage, I plead that the court recognize this man as a danger to society to blatant disregard for human life will eventually cause someone to lose theirs, if not his own. Because of all the pain, sufferings, financial burdens, and overall creation of trauma and issues, 
in the many lives he's affected, I petition that the court give Mr. Hensley the maximum sentence possible for his crimes, so my family and others he's affected may know some semblance of peace. Mr. Hensley, despite everything you've done to my family over this very long process and the disdain I have for you as a human being, I hope that you, your time behind bars will allow you to see life differently and that you can truly find the error of your ways to become better for yourself and your family. So with that statement, um, I think we have two individuals that are reported by um, Mr. Stagel to have suffered emotionally from this, his nine-year-old daughter and his wife, both of whom were in the car at the time. I think that would validate more than 10 points. I object to that. Hold on. So, Mr. Hensley, what is your objection? Tell him prove everything he's saying. If his wife and everybody went through the trial, show me the doctor be able to prove that he went through it. Because right. I can't believe somebody that was slamming brakes on the interstate at 75, 80 miles per hour deal with trauma. You could have killed us and everything behind me. Ain't no such thing as you got trauma for you slamming your brakes. All right. Prove with prove the accusation that you make. Prove it. All right. So sir, I am gonna grant the script like you coming from a movie or something. I am gonna grant the request for score OB4 based on the uh, victim impact statement here it does appear to meet the definition. Now, OB4, for the record, psychological injury to a victim can be scored 10 points if the serious psychological injury may require professional treatment. And in making the determination, the fact that the treatment has not been sought is not conclusive. First, we have the issue of the nine year old in the car, apparently with special needs, and dad, victim as expressed in that statement that was just read into the record, how this is still affecting uh, the minor child. And that makes sense in court as it relates to somebody that's nine years old and was observing somebody pull up next to them and point a handgun at, the, uh, at them. Still haven't been put in for the record. Mr. Hensley, you've been convicted of that, sir, oh, by the court. We can have a lot of we will have all so Please let me finish, and then yeah, I certainly yeah. will give you the opportunity to address the court before sentencing. And then also, pursuant to the statement that was just read into the record from the wife, who also was in the car, according to the testimony at the trial, she is not only suffering from the effects of this, has sought treatment and continues to seek treatment, which is in line with the OV scoring guidelines that professional treatment may be required, in fact, has been and is still being engaged. So we'll score 10 points for OB4. So that will change our total OBs to 35. And does that change the level? Good, John. It changes it to a level four. And so a C4 cell is going to be 523. All right. Any other additions, corrections, or deletions from the people? Uh, no, nothing from, uh, from the people, and the, I know nothing else from the people. So you've read the statement into the record, then nothing else from victims? That's correct, Your Honor. And then anything on behalf of then the people? Your Honor, um, the recommendation on the 0 to 17 guide, uh, guideline range is 12 months on count one and two, and two years on count three preceding the count two sentence. Um, the people did initially support that. Um, but with the change in the sentencing guideline range, obviously this does open up your honor to more opportunity um, for incarceration if you so choose, and we would leave that at your discretion. But otherwise, we ask that you at least follow the recommendation that is intended by Hensley. All right. So, Mr. Hensley, I'm going to give you the opportunity before I ask you to address the court for sentencing. Do you have any additions, corrections, or deletions as it relates to the pre sentence report? Yeah. Yeah, any accusations, corrections, or deletions? All those accusations are false, and none of them have been proven. Okay. Not one. And he talked with this, this, this story. As it relates to this report, do you have any additions, have no corrections, or deletions? Yeah. Excuse me? No, I don't have a report. All right. Uh-huh. So, as it relates to sentencing, is there anything that you want to state to the court before a sentence is imposed? You know, I have my medical information. You know, I have stage three cancer. You know, I have head trauma. You know, I have neck and back injury. I suffer with a dry foot. For the record. Anything else then, Mr. All right. 
So Mr. Hensley has provided, it is accurate, information regarding different uh, medical issues that he has, that he is suffering and is suffering today, as a matter of fact. However, as the court sat through this trial, it's clear to the court that what Mr. Hensley was engaged in is troubling. The testimony of these victims where they were traveling on westbound I-96, minding their own business, when Mr. Hensley's vehicle comes up behind them, the high rate of speed, the victim described with great clarity how close Mr. Hensley and his vehicle were to them to the point they were extremely uncomfortable. Did not, hold on, Mr. Hensley, let the court finish, okay? To the point that uh, they thought they were going to be struck. The victim, I recall, describing un being unable to even see the front of Mr. Hensley's vehicle. That's how close it was, meaning the grill, headlights, I recall the testimony. And that they immediately got over. The victim then went on to describe that Mr. Henley pulled up next to them and pointed a handgun in this manner, of course, pointing over to the right and directly at these individuals. The victim described how he reached back, sort of to shield uh, his family and that they were getting down as best they could. Now, all of that, I think, is certainly um, actions that would cause the victims here to feel their life was in danger if somebody points a gun at them. The fact that somebody is tailgating that closely behind them uh, on the highway at speeds of 70, 75, 80, certainly puts people in danger, could cause people to be incredibly uncomfortable about what's going to happen next. But it's a long way, Mr. Hensley, the court saying, having sat through the trial, you create the situation by driving in a manner that makes these folks uncomfortable by coming up on them at a high rate of speed and following it now that closely. Man. Objection, man. Mr. Hensley. I drive a BMW. Anybody with an autopilot vehicle, you know for a fact it won't do that. Right. That's a so, fact. So Mr. Hensley. Not what he's giving you on out of his mouth. A fact. An automobile will not get up on nobody. Automatical yeah, jam brakes. I told trial, you BMW does that. The trial is over. You oh, had an it's opportunity not it's not to cross-examine those witnesses. I did that, and you deleted everything I said. Yeah, court and you heard ruling. everything that they said was a lie. So now, and you know it was a lie. Let the court finish. All right. So the testimony was as the court has described, and there is no doubt that all of those actions Mr. Hensley is responsible for. And that's the ironic part of it. He creates the situation that causes discomfort for these drivers, and then he's the individual that introduces a gun to the situation. The court heard 404B evidence that was remarkably similar, where Mr. Hensley is right on the bumper of a young lady, in Grand Rapids, Kent County area, and then when she is very uncomfortable and pulls over and stops. Mr. Hensley again introduces a gun, pointing it at that individual. Now I mentioned this because I'm not using that uh, as it relates to a sentencing issue. I'm using that and that it's clear Mr. Hensley drives in a manner that endangers other people, that causes them to report his activity to other people. And then when they attempt to avoid evade, if you will, what his, Mr. Hensley has caused, then he introduces a gun to the situation. Now, Mr. Hensley, I don't have to tell you that it's fairly obvious that in today's world, right, today's world of shall issue CPLs, that even if you believe that somehow you're justified in, in displaying a weapon, and for the record, there's nothing in this trial Nothing this court heard with the 404B evidence or the incident at hand here that we're sentencing you on that would suggest that in any way, shape, or form that you were not responsible, that you had any legal justification to introduce the weapon to it. But even assuming in your own mind that you were, what happens with that in today's world is they would have a very easy 
avenue to articulate I felt in fear for my life or great bodily harm and assuming they were lawfully carrying a gun could take action shoot you in other words and I can remember just a little I only count an incident that occurred just a few blocks from here in which an individual was tailgating a lawful CPL holder going right down Steel Street over here and so that individual, much like here, got over, pulled into the car wash to get away from this guy. And the guy behind him pulls right in behind him, much like in the 404B evidence I heard with you. And so what happens is the CPL holder, what is this guy doing? He's crazy. He pulls his gun. Now, you can argue whether he could articulate at that time, whether he felt his life was in uh, danger of uh, uh, death or great body harm. But regardless, so what happens is the CP, the uh, tailgater, he then also was a valid CPL holder and he pulls his gun. And guess what they did? They shot each other and they both died. The ironic thing is maybe it's the one time, the one time that a government program worked 100% because to get a valid CPL, you have to take this course, do all those things. And part of that is shooting your gun. 15 times or something. I can't remember. I worked um, on home call. I knew about a CP. Yeah, well, well, my point is, so they both hit their mark and they're dead. And it's started from something just like this. And so my point in demonstrating the story to you, retelling the story is when you engage in this kind of behavior, it puts your own life at risk. Put your own life at risk. And that you are lucky that hasn't occurred to you, but you certainly have frightened the heck out of people with what I heard in this trial. You certainly were in the wrong and you're not a valid CPL holder. That's the other problem. Because I don't need it. All right. Well, I recognize you think that you have some fundamental rights that I'm not aware of found either in state or federal constitution. And you certainly can take those up on review, right? I'm really in uh, Western District Court already. So that's fine. Okay. You can appeal anything oh, that he's loved, yeah. any reason you think you have a valid appeal, but they're simply not found in state or federal constitution. And so here we are today. So that's how we end up with a carrying a concealed weapon, felonious assault, felony firearm. And what the court likes to do, Mr. Hensley, is I'm reviewing this. I will say this, I'm weighing positively in a, in a positive manner here. You stand before the court at age 50, you don't have any prior criminal history. Exactly which is somewhat remarkable when I heard about the 404B evidence. So exactly. I don't know how that didn't result in some sort of crime, but it didn't. And I'm recognizing that. And I'm going to recognize that in the sentence I'm going to impose here in a minute. We do have the sentencing guideline now, which is five to 23 months. Court likes to think about the middle. The middle of five to 23 is going to be 14. And I also want to recognize that you don't have any prior criminal history. And that I will also recognize until lately that you've been cooperative with the court. That you showed up to court. That you, uh, as far as I could tell, did your very best to represent yourself and uh, were adamant about doing so and took this matter seriously. All of those things, I think, are things the court can weigh that are positive to you. The negative, though, sir, is the outcome of this is your actions and one causing this and then making it worse with introducing the gun and pointing it at his family on the date in question. Can he prove that? He did prove that. No, he on a reasonable doubt no, at trial. Not. I recognize you disagree with that. Because you had asked the court to decide it. You had the court to decide it. You had somebody in the mouth. Those are all yes. evidentiary issues that you, again, can explore on appellate review, sir. You're welcome to do that. Yes. All right. So as it relates to the car can carrying a Concealed weapon. All right, so carrying the concealed weapon is count or charge number one. Court's going to impose a sentence of 12 months to five years 
That's under the minimum guideline range of, or the middle, I should say, of what the court was looking at at 14 months. So it'd be one year to five years with the Michigan Department of Corrections, and you do have credit now for 14 days that you have previously served. As it relates to the uh, felonious assault, now this would be charge number two, the court's going to impose a sentence of one year to the Michigan Department of Corrections to the statutory max of four years. You will receive credit for 14 days that you have previously served. And then as it relates to count three, this is the felony firearm. The court is required, Mr. Hensley, to impose a sentence of two years with the Michigan Department of Corrections. And then counts one and two that I mentioned earlier will be served concurrently with each other. But this count three by statute is required to be served consecutive with and preceding these other two counts. So two years with the Michigan Department of Corrections. As it relates to the monetary obligations, Mr. Hensley, the court is required by statute to impose $130 as a crime victim rights assessment. Court's going to impose court costs in the amount of $1,500. There'll be a $60 DNA testing fee, and then required by statute are the state costs in the amount of $68 on count one, $68 on two, and $68 on three. All right, so Mr. Hensley, you do have a right, and this is something you're interested in. You've expressed that interest to seek appellate review of the sentence the court has imposed. If you'd like to do that, you have 21 days from today's date to make that request. You have the appellate paperwork there. Right in front of him, along with the pen. All right. You are ready to lift your coat. You want the case now? So hold on. So you have 21 days from today's date to make that request. All right. If you want to ask for a court appointed attorney as it relates to this appellate review, you have a broader window of 42 days to make that request, okay? Because you were convicted at trial, you have an automatic right to seek this review, meaning that if you ask for that review, then the appellate court will have to take a look at it, all right? So if you can, then there's a pen there. I need you to sign. There's two copies of that, one for you to keep, the other one for you to initial and date that you've received it. So if you could do that for me, sir, it's right there on the podium. I'm not signing anything. All right, so for the record, Mr. Hensley Bay is indicating you don't want to sign that, sir? I'm not signing anything. All right, so for the record then, though, I am going to send back with the deputy his copy of the appellate uh, review form. I'm going to place the unsigned appellate review form here. Mr. Hensley, only because we've dealt uh, with this case for so long, if you want to explore these, though, this form is important to you, okay? I recognize that you are refusing to sign it or acknowledge it for the record, but this is something that you want to file timely if you want appellate review of this. They don't okay? have jurisdiction, so they don't have jurisdiction neither do you. All right. Well, I think that the court has jurisdiction, and if you want this reviewed by a Michigan court, then you need to file that. But I'm going to give that to the deputy. We'll keep it in your possession, and you're free to go. Absolutely.